Hello, there's going to be no introduction video or uh, song today because we only have one hour and uh, we have to go. Uh, I have a wonderful guest for the 61st official episode of Unit Corner Club Live. It is a wonderful man, Ernst Van Ziel, er, or Ernest Van Ziel. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the correct pronunciation, but I'm sure he'll tell you when he comes on. So without further ado, let's bring on the man of conscious caracal, Ernst Van Ziel. Thank you for being here today with me, my friend. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And yeah, your pronunciation of my channel name, firstly, is absolutely immaculate. Uh, perfect, uh, perfect form there. When it comes to my uh, my surname, almost there, it's uh, Ernst van Zyl. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't Ernst expect... Van Zyl. Uh, it's, mm, there you go. Okay. Yeah, but I don't expect uh, it to come naturally to uh, too many Americans seeing it as it's, it's very Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine with me. Um, we are live on Entropy now, uh, and also we are live on DLive and Odyssey. Uh, thank you all for watching there. I see we have a few over on DLive already. Um, as usual, uh, uh, those of you that have questions for my illustrious guest, uh, please use the question widget on Entropy, or if you'd like to support both of us, uh, you can put paid chats in the Entropy paid chat block. That's the only way that you can give me money, except for over uh, with paid chats on the hyper chat system on Odyssey. Of course, the paid chats will get preferential treatment at the end of the stream uh, here in about 45 minutes when we shift over to see what you guys want to ask him about his work and Afroform, or did you have just general questions about South Africa? So um, we're going to go ahead and move directly to speaking with him. Uh, the reason why I have come across him is I care about all of the the people in all of Western civilization, whether you be Dutch or English, French or Finnish, all of us have existential battles that we have to fight, not just for us racially speaking, but for the glory of God, for doing what is correct and morally good, and what is culturally important to all of our many different ethnicities in the West. And uh, this man that I have here today, in conjunction with many other great men in South Africa, is really fighting the moral, high-minded, good fight against the forces of evil in South Africa. And I wanted to bring him on and share him with you guys today. So we're going to ask him just a few questions to let you guys all know what he's about and who he is. So let's go ahead and start with a simple question. Can you tell my audience of what kind of content you make and why your channel exists? Hmm. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I really uh, appreciate it. Uh, when it comes to my channel, it, 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 didn't start, it didn't start off as something very serious or with any type of plan. Um, I mean, I always joke about the fact that if I had a plan with my channel in the beginning, I would have chosen a username that's easier to spell than, uh, than Conscious Caracal <laughs> and uh, easier to pronounce for many people. But uh, yeah, it didn't start off with, uh, with any type of ideals or uh, ambitions of becoming like a, a YouTube channel that uploads regularly or creates content regularly. I just wanted to create, I, w I made one video and it was a uh, a while back I've, I've since removed it because it has copyrighted music in it um so yeah i just keep it for sentimental reasons otherwise uh if it didn't have copyright stuff in it i would actually have kept it up just to to see how show people how far i've come but it was a a video i made on after a, a terrorist attack back in 2016 somewhere in the uk if i remember correctly and I was just so angry about the type of uh, rhetoric that was out there, so many falsehoods, so many just misinformation and propaganda on, on social media that I, I thought to myself, well, when if the facts aren't out there, maybe I should just put the facts out there myself. And I started this YouTube channel, created one video, and I made my Twitter account just to promote that one video. And I never intended to do anything further. And then I just... Uh, that video got such a good response that I I made another one and I made more content and uh, it just snowballed from there. But my channel didn't start off as a as it what it is today. It actually went through quite an evolution now. But to answer your question on what it is today, because I think what my channel is today is pretty much what it will be for the very far foreseeable future. Because I think I found a a very nice foundation to build on now, ideologically, belief wise, aesthetic wise, everything. Um, so when it comes to my channel currently, I mostly highlight what's going on in South Africa, but I'm not a, a news analysis channel. So back in the, maybe a few years ago, I would make reaction videos to news events that were happening in South Africa. And those get a lot of traction. They get a lot of, uh, they get a lot of reaction, and a lot of comments, and it actually boosts your channel quite a bit to just re react to current events and, and analyze current events. 
But then I just realized, but that content for me, it, it's not going to last uh, in, in one year or even less. In a month, that content's going to be outdated. Then it's it's just going to be there. Nobody's going to find any value from that analysis to one month, two months, or even a year into the future. So then I shifted my focus a little bit, still focusing on South Africa, but creating more future-based content, if I can, future-proof content, if I can put it that way. Discussing ideas, discussing concepts, discussing organizations and solutions, um, things that people in two years, five years, 10 years can come back and they can still watch the, that content that I create and it will just be as useful to them and they can still learn something from it. Um, nobody's going to watch my uh, analysis of the South Africa 2019 South African election results in 10 years, but they might uh, very well watch my uh, analysis of what my organization that I work for is doing at the moment. Or when I talk to people about solutions like federalism and uh, more communal autonomy in South Africa, those ideas are going to last. But anyway, yeah, that's the type of uh, uh ideas that i focus on but i also uh now and then focus on ideas bigger than south africa i talk to guests from the united states from europe um, and i talk about what's currently troubling their countries what are the challenges that they face and uh, it's trying to also um bring the conversation again uh, to that point where it's more future proof where we're not just talking about oh so this current thing just happened what do you think this means for the next month in global politics rather um maybe you can look at the, something that just happened but then you look at the the bigger picture implications of what's going on here but anyway so that's the the type of content that i create on my channel um, but when it comes to my other social media platforms, like on Twitter, there's a lot more current events, uh, reactions, but again, I'm focusing more and more on South Africa, a lot more than I did maybe three or four years ago with my content. Cause I realized, um, that I don't know that much about, uh, the outside world or other countries as the version of me five years ago thought he did. Um, and I realized that when I looked a bit more deeply at the fact that people outside of South Africa have no idea what's going on in this country. That's why I intro all my episodes with um, greetings from the dark continent, because it is a dark continent in a large extent. People don't know what's going on in Africa. They have the biggest, most absurd misconceptions about what's going on on the continent in South Africa also specifically. But then as I went through that uh, metamorphosis as a channel as I started focusing more on my own country to try and uh, inform many people out there what's going on here I also did some introspection at the same time and realized maybe if all these people on the outside looking in if they don't know so much about South Africa what if I'm that person in reverse in regards to their country what if when I'm commenting on the United States or on the UK or on the Netherlands or on Germany or whatever what if I'm exactly as cringy and exactly as wrong as those people or many people that comment on South Africa on the outside looking in? And that kind of made me pull back a little bit where I've become a lot more open to just listening to people explain what's going on in their country rather than commenting and being normative about what's going on in their country, about making all this content, well, this is what you need to do. This is, this is who you need to vote for. This is the political candidate that I support in your country. I've moved away from that precisely because I realized, well, if so many people are misinformed about my own country, what if that's exactly who I am when you just reverse the roles? I feel that way too. Uh, if you don't mind me speaking for a moment here. Um, no, I, feel, I feel that way too, because uh, I, about five or six years ago, I started to realize just how weaponized uh, racial struggles were in my country. And it started to open my eyes to, all this different kinds of, of lies and manipulations that have been tearing people apart, not just along the lines of race, but class and gender and all these other problems. And it really sort of has this same destructive, uh, if you want to call it Marxist source of rich people that just want to turn groups against one another for the sole purpose of having conflict, disarray and hatred because they, they want to, I think that the people that are behind this in all these countries they just want to create harm to the stable population so they can profit and prey on the destruction. That seems to be sort of 
the case with every country I study that has these problems. And we know from Rhodesia and what happened in Zimbabwe and, you know, I don't, we, we don't need to get into the history of, of the Southern parts of Africa and all of the, these tactics that have been used to destroy lives. You and I both know them very well, but I started realizing when I studied South Africa and what was going on in France and then the Iberian Peninsula, I really was clueless about cultures outside of America. And that's when I stopped trying to formulate any kind of strong opinion, because every time I would interview someone from a different country, I would learn just how wrong everything that my media had told me about them was. <laughs> so mm. so uh, that's what led me to wanting to, to care about South Africa, because it, it's sort of the if you want to see what the what the world economic forum and and the and the the big globalist evil people what i call the anti white or the anti western agenda a lot of their plans are sort of advanced in south africa that they're trying to push on us here so uh, it's kind mm. of the canary in the coal mine so to speak and that's when i became really invested in south africa about a year ago and i interviewed a man that you might know mr patriarch he lived in south africa for quite some time mm. and he came on and told me all about the different ethnic groups and the history of them working together or against each other in South Africa, uh, the differences of what race and ethnicity means down there, how it intersects with politics. And it was a really good long stream we had educating me and my viewers about the complexities of South Africa that as an outsider, you really don't understand because you just can't know unless you're there. So it was a really great stream. So I definitely sympathize with what you said uh, about all of that right there. So well, let me ask you one question. This is just an off-the-cuff question that came to mind. Uh, what's the mm. most surprising thing that you learned about the United States or American culture that you were wrong about? What what just really surprised you that you can remember? I think uh, the biggest, I would say, red pull on America and my own capacity would be I realized how different, how different states view themselves in regard not regards to their identity but regards to their their politics i thought that the the big culture war in america i was under the inf not the inf i was under the impression that the the culture war in america was a lot more broad based and everywhere it's basically the same and then i realized but from state to state politics completely differs in america and i was not aware of that many years ago as i am now where analysis of politics in Texas is nothing like uh, the politics of New York or the politics of uh, California. I, mm -hmm. I think I just became more aware of the, the political diversity within your own country and how state on a state by state basis, how drastically it sometimes differs. It's almost like America is seven or eight different countries because you've got sort of the Appalachian ethnicity, the deep Southern ethnicity, the mm -hmm. Eastern and Western coastal city ethnicities, the central heartland ethnicity, the Great Lakes ethnicity, and then sort of the, the Southwestern desert Mexican style ethnicity. And it's a bunch of different people that sort of have the same values and share a lot of genetics, but we also have a lot of different, uh, and in some cases, conflicting cultural history. So America is, is a lot more complex than people think when it comes to governance and cultural values going back and forth uh, across different mm. states. It, it's a lot more complicated than outsiders might think. <laughs> We're not all just Texans that like guns and bacon. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, let's go. Yeah, no, absolutely. Talk. And yeah, that's I think that's something that I become more aware of. But at the same time, that exactly the same thing applies to South Africa as well. I mean, we're a country of 11 official languages. So there's there's Zulus, there's Chongas, there's Vendas, there's Kozas, there is Afrikaners, there's English South Africans, there's Indian South Africans. The, the list goes on. There's, there's so many different groups. And then if you were to look at South Africa just through a simplistic lens, it, it wouldn't make sense to you. You wouldn't be able to figure out mm -hmm. who's who and who's the enemy of who and who's the ally of who. Uh, one, uh, two groups that are, that's, are the same uh, race, two black groups might uh, have an ancestral hatred towards each other, while one white group and the other black group get, a well very, get along yep. very well. And it's not gonna. You're not gonna. It's not gonna make sense to you unless you look at the history and you realize, oh wait, this group group has a 500 year old blood feud with this one, and this group, their ancestor three or four generations back helped this other group's ancestor. It's very complex, and you have to understand yeah. these things because that type of cultural politics filters into party politics in South Africa as well. So you'll see this in the ANC, the ruling party, for example, where. You have internal cultural battles where 
the, the, the previous president, for example, Jacob Zuma, he was a Zulu. So when he was uh, elected president of the ANC, he filled the ANC with many Zulu appointments uh, and many people that are culturally very loyal to him. And then uh, when the next president comes in, Ramaphosa, he purges many Zulus again. And then you get, uh, it's this constant tug of war between different cultures in South Africa. And it's, you need to understand these complexities if you if you want to stand any chance of knowing uh, what's going on here. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be you're just going to be confused and you're just going to sit there on the sideline and things are not going to make sense. Because it, especially compared to to other, uh, I, I consider South Africa a Western country to a large degree. Uh, like a Western country, or unlike a lot of Western countries, there is not such tribal, ethnic, racial, etc. divisions with different multi-layered histories together, with different reasons to have, like you said earlier, animosity or friendship. I haven't encountered that in America, and I don't know of any European country today that is a lot like that. And so South Africa is kind of in a unique place, and that's one of the reasons why I like having on South Africans, because they know that not only are there, there are truisms about race and ethnic differences, but there are also falsehoods too. And it's important not to be distracted by the falsehoods or inflamed by one side or the other's propaganda. It's important to know the truth and to seek doing what's right and just in all situations, not just what's mm. best for your side of the culture war, so to speak. And that's why I like having yeah. on high-minded South Africans like yourself. <laughs> mm, well, so, thank you very much. Yeah, I think the, the biggest lesson from South Africa is uh, when you when you identify your allies and when you identify the people that you'd like to fight alongside, it's unfortunately not as easy as just choosing the people that look like you. Um, yeah. That's uh, <laughs> unfortunately not not as simple. Uh, your like biggest I say enemies all the time, might, uh, most of the exactly worst like anti-whites in America are white people. So it's not like you can just look at someone <laughs> yeah, and know if they're friend or foe all the time. <laughs> mm. So I think, uh, yeah, that simplistic approach to to friend the friend enemy distinction is going to get you into a lot of trouble. And I think uh, that's one of the big lessons from South Africa. But yeah, it's I think something else that's important to take into account when it comes to South Africa is uh, also just when you look at the the politics, it's 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 very very different from uh, what you'd get in the in the U.S. ideologically. I mean, you at least have right leaning options we we don't uh, our yeah. political parties that if i were to go to the uh, if there was an election this year and i go to the uh, to vote in that election my realistic options are between far left left and center left that's my options uh, in yeah. the political spectrum of south africa reasons that i like what you talk about and what you promote on your channel it's very similar to the ideas that i promote and i like because even though we on surface have right-leaning op options to vote for hmm. the conservative people that you can vote for and the bulk of the conservative parties in america they're still for mass migration they still bow down to the world economic forum in the un they still want to destroy our infrastructure and and gut our entire eco economy and send it overseas and it's just it doesn't really matter what they say or what the parties are. They've demonstrably shown me for the last 30 years they're all on the same team and don't really give crap about us. So that's why I think parallel building, creating organizations and churches and businesses made mm. by people like us who care and inviting others to participate, I think that's one of the strongest ways we can fight against this machine. But as you and I both know, just going after it with guns and bullets isn't going to work. That, that, and on, on top of that, that'll just make you a martyr or, or get you thrown in prison for life. And it feeds their narrative of anti-white hatred against us that they put in the media. So I think that the best thing we can do is use our vote, use our minds with our people in, in civilization the best we can to sort of stem the darkness. But at the same time, we have to be higher minded than just going to vote mm -hmm. and actively building the future that, that we and our children are supposed to have going forward because no one else is building that for us. We have to build it right now ourselves. And so mm. that's why I have the tagline on my channel of uh, to recapture our destiny, we must build a community because I think that's mm. what it's all about is moral, right minded people coming together, whether Christian or otherwise. I know that there are good folks out there who may be also true or or non participants, but, uh, you know, good Christian people coming together, building communities, much like the Dutch have done uh, to create the wonderful civilization that, that was South Africa. And I think that 
the the people that made South Africa set a really good model, sort of like how the pioneers and people that built America set a good model that we should emulate today. What do you think mm. about that? Yeah. No, well, uh, maybe what you just said there links back to what I said before that and what I'm going to say now. Okay. I think the 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 faster you you realize as westerners that you shouldn't put all your destiny eggs into the the party politics basket the the better for you don't i'm not going to blackpool you on party politics and say completely abandon it don't take part no take take part in party politics uh, be politically active uh, don't uh, completely shun it but at the same time like i said don't put all your eggs into that basket um you need to start building yourself and the other thing is and this is the hard part because a lot of people hear this type of advice but they don't really act on it and that's the fact that don't wait for someone smarter stronger more well-read more intellectual than you to do all the, the the hard work and the building and you're pretty much just telling yourself when that big leader when he uh, uh, appears on the horizon i will follow i'm ready to follow no you're going to have to do it yourself man those reinforcements aren't coming and uh, this is, like i said this isn't a black pull this is a real this is a very deep red pull where it's not hopeless the situation is absolutely not hopeless if the situation was hopeless uh, their propaganda would be unnecessary exactly. When, exactly when it comes to finding a way through the darkness that way is going to have to be you're going to have to light your own torch as well but they're gonna the the good thing is they're gonna be a lot of people around you to do it as well don't i'm not a i'm not an individualist but uh, when it comes to this type of thing individual action or taking and um, uh, taking action uh, is something everyone needs to do you can't just wait for people like i said stronger bigger uh, better informed than you more popular than you to to do yeah. all the heavy lifting and do the things you're going to have to start doing your part even if it's that's, a small part that's one of the things i like about you and afroform you encourage people to get active in constructive healthy ways that are mm. not just good for themselves but set a good example for others and inspire others to take actions to to collectivize in healthy ways and one of the things that i dislike about how uh modernity and the framework of liberalism has sort of shaped the words individual and collective right uh, I think that it's not just individualism or collectivism. Those things aren't mm. mutually exclusive. Like collectives right. obviously are led by exceptional individuals. And mm. uh and Western exceptional people, individuals are made by exceptional collectives or communities. Exactly. And and Western people, we have a very strong stroke of individualism in us already. Mm. That ain't going anywhere. But in a world of powerful competing collectives, being an individual is just suicide. Because mm. there are powerful, obvious collectives all vying for power and resources on this planet. And the faster that Western people, whether you be Dutch or South African or French or Finnish or, or live in the United States, you need to realize you are part of a collective group, whether you like it or not. And you need to participate for the well-being of that group because there are other groups out there that want to come take your land and your future away for, for their group. That's just the nature of man on this on this earth. And so we have to be cognizant of that but also act morally and not and not step into the same pitfalls of the past when it comes to warfare and ethnic conflict and that mm. kind of thing. So and that's the that, reality of living on a planet uh, filled with fallen beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, we're about at the half hour mark. So let's go ahead and move to my next question. Now I could talk to you all day about this because we have, we, we have good chemistry together and we believe similar things. It's nice to speak to you. But uh, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about is what led you to being the man you are today with your public voice, saying the things that you do out loud? Um, would you, is there a particular family experience you'd like to share or mm. a particular journey that you went on perhaps to make you the man you are today that put you on the screen mm. here today? Well, uh, it's it's not an amazing epic uh, story. It's very simple. Uh, it's it's how my parents raised me. Um, specifically, uh, what my father instilled in me of uh, when you see injustice, you you speak up. When uh, you gotta, if you have the opportunity to speak against evil and to put a a, a knife uh, into evil, then you do it. Uh, that's the that's the way I was I was raised. Don't just. Uh, don't just sit on the sideline and uh, do nothing. Uh, you have to do your part in regards to the great chain of being, and uh, that's just the the way that I was that I was raised. And uh, I was raised that I, way too. 
Mm, we'll see that. I think there's a there's a big commonality between Afrikaners and Americans is really that type of value and the, that value of don't just sit silently when you see injustice. Don't just sit silently when you see uh, someone in trouble. You have to do your part. You have to do mm-hmm. your part to to help your community. And uh, it doesn't have to be, like I said, an epic story. You don't have to be the main character. You can just do your small contribution and that's still going to go a long way and the thing is i think that's one of the i'm going to go on a bit of a tangent but i think it's important it's the one of the biggest lies that was told to my generation uh the the generation z was the fact that uh, you were told at least i was told in school that you need to grow up to change the world you the world it needs to be your project you need to grow up to become like a world leader you need to change the world mm-hmm. Uh, and it's such a cruel lie. Uh, nobody, almost nobody can change the world. You need to, and this is, I mean, uh, for for all his faults, uh, uh, Jordan Peterson is onto something when he said, mm-hmm. start at home, start by cleaning your room. I mean, it's a big cliche, but it's absolutely true. Start off with the small things that you can do. And that's something that I've learned working for Afri Forum as well. For example, let's say... Th- th- Crime is a very big problem in South Africa, but you're not going to solve crime on a national level. Not, It's not possible. Let you, alone you, a global you, level. <laughs> let alone a global level. So how do you solve that? How do you solve the problem that your country has a crime problem? You start by joining a neighborhood watch and make sure that your neighborhood doesn't have a crime problem. Before your, you make sure your neighborhood doesn't have a crime problem, you make sure your street doesn't have a crime problem. That's how it works. That's how you bring about realistic change. Otherwise, you're just going to give yourself these lofty ambitions of I'm going to change the world. I'm going to become a world leader. Um, and then you don't reach them and then you're black pulled and you just become absolutely dumped in nihilism and uh, you feel terrible about yourself. Rather set uh, goals that you can reach like for example let's say the moral decay of your nation is something that really troubles you you're not gonna you're not on your own going to be able to put uh, your nation on the right track again morally but you can make sure your household is on the right track morally you can make sure your friend group is on the right track morally you can make sure your neighbors are on the right track morally those are real changes you can make So I'm going to go against the grain and say, stop thinking and dreaming big and start thinking and dreaming small and practical. That's how you really make a difference. And that's how you feel great about the differences that you make because you can see them in real time. If you put, give yourself two lofty, unreachable ambitions, you are destining yourself for failure and for black pull them. (laughs) I agree with you. A, A big, a big focus on my channel for the last two years has been telling people to get actively involved in localism. Uh, mm. It's a new ism that I started talking about, and apparently it existed long before I, I came up with the word. Uh, but it's the right word. It's, it's, it's exactly right what word. it's ex- exactly what I'm describing as well. It's I got about three years ago. I got sick of the the anti white Marxist globalist encroachment in the mm. university near here, and in one of the uh, um, it's not really a PTA group. It's like a parent guardian group, and they sort of decide who gets to do what with uh, local education and, and what books get to go into schools and things. So I went and got in their faces and fussed at them and argued, and I inspired other people to do the same. And then one of the things that made my channel popular is I went to this, uh, there was a Black Lives Matter, a BLM art exhibit uh, that showed just a lot of just abjectly anti-white stuff, like really ugly stuff to do with slavery and hanging people and, and doing unspeakable things all couched in this, uh, oh, it's not really uh, anti-white. It's not really about killing and hurting white people. And yet that's exactly what the imagery shows. And so I got in the face and and argued with uh, not only the person putting the exhibit on, but the director of that small art building there. And we got it on camera. Uh, I had people with me and they filmed it. And it was me using the Go Free lexicon of the Go Free book I told you about, um, just confronting people and saying, It's not right if you say you don't want there to be racial animosity to show this racially inflaming violent rhetoric that seems to promote one against the other. And it doesn't matter really at the end of the day what color is what. It's morally wrong and you're being evil for promoting this. And when you couch it that way, they don't have any of their 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 narrative approved wiggle words to get around that. 
They either have to agree and say, yes, I approve of this evil message and we're going to push it anyway, or they have to start breaking down the lies that they're putting forward. And so I think that on a local level, we can have a lot of success with that because at a local level, it's usually a handful of rotten people or weak-willed people being pressured by rotten people to do the bad stuff and inject the bad things into your local area. Mm -hmm. And if just five or six people are aware of that and get in their faces and start shutting it down, well, that's great. You can do that on a local level. You can do that at your church. You can do that at your PTA. And it's actually an achievable goal. Yeah. And, if, and, if, and the more that we do that and the more we use the Internet to inspire others to do that and follow our successful methods... I think that we actually have a fighting chance of saving our countries and, and riding the, this this ugly spiritual cancer that's in us and actually fixing things without it becoming an ugly war again. Oh, what do you think about that? Hmm. No, that's that's absolutely what I'm saying in regards to uh, doing setting goals that are achievable, but not like I said, waiting uh, on on uh, on heroes because uh, that's we don't we're not living in a film, we're not living in a fantasy book. Uh, this isn't Lord of the Rings where the, some hero is going to just appear and save the realm. Uh, you're going to have to save your own realm and your own dominion in your own small capacity, in your own humble capacity. And uh, stop stop waiting on other people to do it. And uh, that's the thing. When it comes to South Africa as well, that's how AfriForum started. I mean, now uh, I'm... AfriForum is the, the largest civil rights organization in the Southern Hemisphere with 300,000 members. And But it start, didn't start off that way. In 2006, when the organization was founded, it started off with three employees and zero members. That's that's how it starts. Um, it but now we're, a, now we're a force that uh, can compel our own go- nation's government to do, uh, to do certain things and to uh, uh, back off on when they try to uh, infringe on our rights or try to villainize or attack minorities in our country. Um, the funny thing is when I talk about minorities, your American brain completely shifts to a, uh, something else. <laughs> not, not mine because I, I, I have mm. opened my mind now, but uh, I understand what mm. you mean by that. I understand mm. what you mean. So um, minority groups in South Africa take take many forms. We have linguistic, cultural, racial, uh, so many different types of minority groups, and that's something that AfriForum focuses on. But uh, just to finish that point, it starts off somewhere. You don't just start off with a, a small loan of a million dollars. You you start off with a very small, humble beginning, and then you build from there. And you have to keep at it because it's not success is not going to drop into your lap. Uh, I see too many people start with a good idea, start with a good project, and then they give up within a month or a few weeks because they don't get instantly get the results that they wanted. It's a long grind, and you're going to have to keep at it. I think the, the best metaphor for it would be a YouTube channel. I mean, yeah. when you start creating content, you got to grind for that 15 views per video, and you're, when you get that first 50 views for a video, you're ecstatic. But I mean, that's that's where it goes. When you get 100 subscribers, you're like, that's amazing. And then you start building momentum. But people don't you realize. You have been at this, this game for years now. And we, yeah. don't, we don't even have 10,000 subs yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, We've been my at it channel, for years. Yeah. I've been, I've been uploading content since 2016. So that's six years. And I'm, uh, I'm not even at 10,000 subscribers yet. But that's, that's the grind. That's what you yeah. have to do. That's how you build something. But like I said, the YouTube channel is the metaphor. But building any institution or organization or club or any initiative starts exactly like a YouTube channel in that regard. I think now is the is a great time to transition to talking about Afriforum. So hmm. uh, I'd like to start off with a short little 30 second video and then we'll speak at length about Afriforum. So we're going to go ahead and pop this up. I have it ready. Hmm. Uh, this is from Rene uh, van der Pfeiffer. Did I say that correctly? Rene van der Pfeiffer. Van der Pfeiffer. Yeah. Uh, this is Afriforum Youth uh, hmm. handed the president a book on basic economics, facts, and fallacies. It was received by a representative of the president's office at the union buildings. The youngsters' distrust results from the ANC government's constant failure to create jobs. We'll talk about more of that in a minute after this short 30 second mm. video. Coffee for the Youth is at the Union Buildings today to hand over this economy book to the president. We are very concerned about the youth unemployment rate skyrocketing for the past three decades. And now, uh, in the week of Youth Day, he announced that he wants to launch a new social employment fund. But we are concerned that this will not increase. 
to our young people. In contrary, it will only make them more dependent on the state. We hope that this book, Economic Facts and Fallacies, will help them in the right direction. So that was just mm. a little uh, a little example of uh, active young people. With uh, that was the mm. Afro Forum Youth uh, faction, yeah. and um, yeah. I Oh yeah, no. I just wanted to say I was actually there for this campaign. Uh, I, I'm not part of Afri Forum Youth, uh, but I was there to give them some guidance and to give them some advice with this campaign today. So I was there at the union buildings where this video was uh, was shot today. Tell us a bit now about what Afri Forum is, like it, like its main hmm. mission statement, and then we'll get into what uh, the successes that it's had recently. So go ahead and tell us what it is, and then we'll move to the successes. Right. And I'll go ahead and share the link to Afriform in all the chats while you're doing mm. it. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, when it comes to Afriform, simply put, we're a civil rights organization. So, we, But at the same time, we're also specifically with a focus of fighting for minority rights in South Africa. So our focus, well, firstly, maybe I should say uh, we are a proudly Afrikaner organization. We speak Afrikaans at work. All our campaigns are in Afrikaans. We fight for the Afrikaans language rights. And we focus largely on the Afrikaner community and providing the Afrikaner community with cultural infrastructure and uh, all the, the the things that the, the Afrikaner community would need uh, in its fight against uh, all types of uh, threats from the state and from the government and other uh, from other sources. But at the same time, we fight for many other minority rights as well, because we, when we fight for minority rights, we at the same time fight for Afrikaner rights, because the Afrikaner, uh, Afrikaners are a minority group in South Africa. Um, we also fight uh, other larger, broad fights that are not specifically Afrikaner or minority rights based, like, for example, our fight against expropriation without compensation. Um, mm. our fight That's a big for one. Mm, that's a very big one. Our, our fight against uh, racial discrimination, racially discriminatory laws in South Africa. So those are laws like black economic empowerment. It sounds very nice. It's absolutely the opposite of what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Black economic empowerment laws are basically laws that say in very simple terms that your company needs to have 51% uh, black ownership. Otherwise, you don't get uh, support from the government. A good example was during uh, 2020, it's, it's, yeah, just, it's just modern pleasant speech on top of <laughs> ugly Marxist communism. <laughs> uh, absolutely, but, but with a very strong racial tinge to it. So when mm -hmm. it comes to a... Uh, an example of that would actually demonstrate what Afri Forum also does. So in 2020, the, the government started a tourism relief fund for uh, during the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, this fund was started to help small businesses that were struggling. But the fund uh, had racial criteria attached to it. So if you didn't have enough black management in your business, you wouldn't qualify for uh, relief from the government. So yeah, your business is just going to have to uh, shrivel up and die. That's pretty much what the government told you if you're if you're too white, basically. And that's we took that uh, tourism relief fund to court and we won. We got it uh, uh, declared unlawful and unconstitutional. So that's the type of fights that we fight. And I mean, uh, another thing that we do is we, when it comes to our community-based solutions. Um, we have over 155 neighborhood watches, so all across the country. These are all volunteers that get together. That's incredible. But, Af but Afri, yeah, well, it's uh, I'm very proud to to be able to to give you that information. And uh, these are 155 different uh, little uh, uh, neighborhood watches all across the country. Uh, I think over 10,000. Uh, uh, well, I'm looking for the word now. Um, in Afrikaans, it's a uh, uh, volunteers, uh, over ten thousand volunteers that take part in this, and uh, they keep their community safe through patrolling at night. A lot of them also do farm patrols uh, in regards to fighting uh, farm murders and farm attacks. That's also another issue that we uh, feel strongly about and fight strongly against. We do uh, international uh, campaigns to bring attention to farm murders and farm attacks and the scourge of that. Uh, and then we also. Um, have many other uh, uh, initiatives that we do on a community basis. So we have also 150 branches all across the country, and these branches do all uh, all these different community-based things to make their communities better. So they keep their communities clean. They also uh, paint street signs. They also fix full potholes. Every forum fills thousands of potholes every year. That's um, wonderful. And, I and didn't know they all, did that too. 
Mm, yeah, well, that's that's just scratching the surface. I'm just saying what I can remember off the top of my head. And then we also, um, uh, we keep, for example, uh, graveyards clean and safe because in South Africa, graveyards have become very uh, dangerous uh, to visit, for one thing, and also very uh, neglected uh, by the municipality. So Afroforum helps keep those safe and clean. Um, we also protect uh, Africana and other uh, uh, South African heritage sites. Um, and then we also, what we do, when it comes to uh, the bigger picture, is that we help our uh, communities become state-proof. That's uh, the word that, or the, the term that we use. So we make communities as as little dependent on the government as possible, uh, in, in in as many ways as possible. And a good example of that would be the security that we do. So we have many security initiatives that we do of which uh, farm patrols and uh, neighborhood watches are an example of but that's an example of becoming state proof you you uh -huh. become state proof in your own security by taking back responsibility for your security so it's it's much easier and uh, uh, it's very tempting to say well the police will have to keep me safe i pay taxes the government needs to keep me safe i don't have time to go on neighborhood watch patrol but then you don't either don't get the service or you get terrible service or you get corrupt policemen and you start realizing, well, I'm going to have to either take my security into my own hands uh, and take responsibility or I'm not going to be secure. And that's, that's think, the whole philosophy of becoming state proof. I, I would very much like there to be uh, a version of what Afroform is everywhere that, that I think our people should thrive whether it's in Appalachia, whether it's in the Iberian Peninsula, whether it's uh, on the coast of the Black Sea. I think that wherever our people are and thrive, we should not be reliant on bureaucratic management for the necessities of life, food, security, mm -hmm. producing our own materials, uh, finished goods like clothing and shoes and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. One of the things that really haunts me about my local area in Appalachia like in a lot of ways, it's way far behind modernity. Like the way I grew up, it might as well be in 1900 or 1910, the way I grew up. Lots of people didn't have electricity. We, we had outhouses. People still chopped their own wood to throw in little Franklin stoves and cheap little cinder block or log mm. cabin houses. And we live that way. We've been living that this way for like 200 and some years out here. And here's the thing, though. Now, most of the men that were plumbers, electricians, builders, farmers, they only had one or two kids. Those kids had their heads full of anti-Western lies to hate themselves, to hate their heritage. They went off to these cancerous anti-white university professors that told them that their heritage was responsible for everything evil under the sun. And so there was no one for them to pass their trade and their business off to. And now in the last 10 years, mom and pop shops, private businesses for plumbing, electrician, woodworking, those are just disappearing because their kids were poisoned mentally and spiritually against wanting to be invested and carry on this way of life. And I think that's why the mind war, the spirit war against us is the worst one. Because if we are having this evil steal our children away from us, the few children that we can afford, and then make them either our direct enemies or just not care with apathy and atheism and being addicted to porn and drugs and sex and all this other stuff, then it, it rots us and it robs us of having a posterity to carry us to the future. Mm -hmm. And a big way that I think we can fix that is realizing now we have to create an entire living framework that en encompasses business, trade, material production, all the stuff we just talked about. So children can grow up seeing the value of that. And we have to actively impart that to them and not passively, uh, like you talked about passivity earlier, just waiting for the Caesar to come. We can't do that. We can't let a teacher or a priest or anyone else that is far removed from our communities install values into our children. We have to do that. And I think the best way we can is, like you said, being state proof. We, we don't want to have to be reliant on these big NGOs or government entities to give us the necessities of life. Yeah. And so I think that what you guys are doing with Afroform 
is amazing. And I would really like people to understand that framework and those ideas and start implementing them on a small scale locally where I live and where many other concerned people like us live all across the West. So that's another reason I wanted to have you on today is to expose mm. people to, hey, there's a whole bunch of people doing the stuff that I think is important down in down in South Africa. And they've been doing it for years and they're really successful with it. Mm. And so I know what I want works because they're doing it down there. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's the thing is, I mean, I haven't even started talking about the Solidarity movement. So Afri Forum is just the civil rights wing of the Solidarity movement. So that's the Solidarity movement is a, a collection of organizations. So it's the Solidarity uh, uh, Labor Union, which was the, the initial organization. From mm -hmm. them, uh, we got uh, Afri Forum. Uh, there's also help in the Solidarity Help in the Hunt. There are many of these other organizations in that movement. So we also have Academia, which is our, uh, educate, our, our tertiary educational um, institution. And then we have, for example, Saltic, which uh, the Solidarity movement built. It's a technical college campus. And if you want to go see how it looks, just Google Saltic. That's S-O-L-T-E-C-H. Um, it's an entire campus, 300 million rand Soltec? campus. S-O-L-T-E-C-H? Yeah. Soltec? Soltec? Okay. Yes. It's a it's a 300 million rand campus that we finished uh, last year, and it's a technical college. So it's where people learn trades. It's a technical college where you can learn to be a plumber, an electrician, a carpenter, uh, all these technical trades, and where you become tradesmen. And it was built, and you're not going to believe me, but it, this is the absolute true gospel truth. It was built through donations by regular people and no donation single donation exceeded 10 rand 10 rand is not even a dollar 10 rand is wow 70 cents <laughs> wow that's that's worse than poverty level here and uh, yeah it was just built uh, uh with the donation no, none of the donations exceeded 70 cents and oh none of the donations the, oh i'm sorry i misunderstood no the that. donations the donations oh. that they that that helped fund the university, uh, none of the donations exceeded seventy cents. But the, oh, but I see what was, you mean. I see what yeah. you mean. It was a it was a, a ground up small yes. donation campaign. So there wasn't was a, the there wasn't steel bucks it. coming in there. There wasn't a big money Elon Musk type of donations coming in. It was small very small donations coming in from regular people on a monthly basis. Well, I hope and that I can get something a... off the ground here like that. <laughs> I, I'm doing what I can to try to get people inspired and motivated to build exactly what you guys have built in South Africa here in mm. Appalachia. So far, though, it's a hard sell. Nobody's buying. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe things are going to have to get worse. Maybe the, the temperature of boiling the frog is going to have yeah. to go up a little more. <laughs> <laughs> but see, it's not about it's not about you building an army of ten thousand followers right now. Right. It's about finding one other person that works yep. with you, and then finding one more person. Then you're three. Then you build a team of four. Then you build well, a right team now, of five. Uh, I mentioned to you on another stream, this was a few months ago, that uh, the Go Free Clubs, the, the white well-being community here in America, mm. it's very similar to what Afroform is putting together in South Africa. Right now, we're just loosely connected across America, and we're building little things called Go Free Clubs. Uh, the nature of the word go free is go free from the, the lies of the anti-white narrative and, and live in a positive way. The Go mm. Free Clubs are, are the building blocks of what Afroform became. We're trying to make these little groups of people that get together and share ideas and share work and ethics together uh, to, to, to either safeguard the same place or just get used to meeting and operating in the same local area to bring families together and, and hopefully build community. But America is so big geographically, it's hard to get mm. people together. So um, I do have three people interested in making a little go free club here locally. We're trying to get that together. I've got people emailing me and um, hopefully by next year, I'll have something more official to celebrate. Mm. So, so pray for me and pray for us here in Appalachia that we'll be able to build something like Afroforum here. <laughs> mm, well, that's what I, that's why I told you the story of how Afriforum started. It started off with three employees. It started off with nothing. It started off with zero members. And then it's uh, now we have 300,000 strong, but it starts off, like I said, a team of one, then a team of two, then a team of three, then a team of four, and then you build from there. But yeah, yeah when it comes to the solutions that we create, it's, it's all about becoming state proof. It's not really about retaking state or governmental power. Um, I mean, I'm going to say, I give you a hot take now that I think a lot of people need to think about. When it comes to why do you think or why AfriForum and people like us took a state proof approach 
it was because the previous generation uh, of Afrikaners put everything they had, their entire destiny, in the hands of the state during apartheid. And when that yeah. state apparatus fell, when that system collapsed, they were they had to start from scratch. Everything was gone. They had they had given. Uh, over to the state responsibility for their security, for the preservation of their culture, for preservation of their children and their values, of their schools, of their universities, everything. Afrikaners uh, gave the state the responsibility under apartheid to manage everything. And when they lost control of the state, they had to start from scratch again. You, you, you basically fall down all the way to rock bottom when it comes to all these responsibilities. Now you have to start building your own security apparatus from scratch again. Now you have to start building your own educational institutions from scratch again because the state-based yeah. educational institutions are not going to preserve your language. They're not going to preserve your culture or your values. The police are horribly corrupt uh, and they're not going to be able to provide you your safety. Suddenly, you can't, uh, for, for decades, uh, Afrikaners could depend on the state. And then when the state, uh, they couldn't depend on the state anymore, they were left out in the cold. So that's my, my more heat or my more morbid warning to, to not just Americans, but uh, uh, Westerners all across the world. Don't, don't put all your eggs in the state basket. Uh, trust me, uh, I'm, I'm speaking from experience from a, a group of people that did, and we paid a, a heavy, heavy price. I think that's an excellent place to, uh, to round off talking about Afroform and why the uh, uh, being uh, state proof is so, is so critically important. We shared a lot of good things together there for the viewers. And I think that the viewers listening have a good understanding now about not just the Afroform in general, but what it's doing uh, in, a, in, in applied action to make people's mm -hmm. lives better. So for the last 10 minutes that we have you today, um, let's go ahead and see what the chat is saying. And uh, we'll read some, uh, some paid chats first, sure. and then we'll get to some unpaid chats if we have time. So we're going to mm -hmm. start on Cash App and see if there's anything over there, because I haven't refreshed it for a while. And we still have nothing on Cash App. Uh, over on uh, Odyssey, we don't have any hyper chats, and we don't have any paid chats on DLive. We do have quite a few things on Entropy, however. Uh, we have Shelly. Uh, Shelly for two things. Uh, first up, uh, for three U.S. dollars, Shelly says, "What? Uh, this is for you, Ernest. Or Ernst. Uh, mm. What do you see in one, the immediate, and two, long-term future in South Africa?" Mm. And it's sort of an open-ended question, so you can be brief since we don't right, have a lot right. of time. <laughs> right. No, um, uh, I just firstly want to say I'm very cautious of making uh, future predictions because I think it's often a fool's <laughs> folly. But uh, I'll, I'll try my best seeing as you did get a question specifically asking it. I'm not going to bat it away. Sure. Short term future, uh, continued state decline. Um, and uh, the ANC is not going to be able to turn it around. Their government is going to lose capacity to enforce their laws and law and order and their policies by the day. And uh, unemployment is going to start get, uh, going to get worse, and uh, the economy is not really going to get jump started because the ANC can't uh, give up their uh, their devotion to the National Democratic Revolution, the entire ideology that drives them. It's a uh, it's it's pretty much the the DNA of the ANC is the National Democratic Revolution or the NDR. So when it comes to the long term future, um, Joe. Sure. Then it gets difficult, but I'll try my best. I'm I'm really trying. I'm I'm peeking through the mists of time into the future, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll try my best. When it comes to the long term future of South Africa, I don't see a a future where the ANC uh, rules forever. I think uh, the party is uh, hemorrhaging support. It's like a wounded animal, and you can see it. Uh, I mean, just this week, um, uh, someone uh, that I know, Ian Cameron, a uh, very good guy, uh, he was a uh, asking questions to the minister of police uh, Beke Chele and he was asking such difficult questions that the police minister told, shouted at him in the meeting to shut up to sit down and shut up and he then was escorted out of the meeting by by policemen wow. because he was asking too difficult questions that's showing me that the ANC is in a diff they they are worried. They are a wounded animal. They they're not uh, in their prime. They're not building towards uh, something great. They are tumbling down the hill and they're trying to brace their fall. And people are getting nervous and jumpy. Well, that was an um, so excellent that, answer. I appreciate you giving that. So let's yeah, go ahead so and move on to the next one. In, that would inform my 
my, my views of the future, just that, that simple element. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Shelly, also for three U.S. dollars. Thank you, Shelly. She says, when did Marxism begin to work its way into South African politics and how mm. has it in, and how did they influence people so quickly? Hmm. Another for another, another fairly open-ended question. <laughs> no, yeah. We could probably well, talk for a whole hour on just that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say uh let me let me put it this way. I I'm not well versed enough on the history of Marxism in South Africa to give you exactly how it happened, but I can give you some insights into the the breeding ground that made it possible. So what made it possible in South Africa is what we refer to as the great liberal slide away, where there was all these, what you would refer to today as classical liberals. Back in the day, they were just called liberals. Uh, classical liberals are just liberals that put that label there to try and disassociate themselves from their, their misbehaving uh, ideological twins or their ideological children. But that's a conversation for another day. Um, so these classical liberals of the past were very keen to uh, for allies because they were against the apartheid system, but they needed allies. So they, they chose the Marxists as their allies and they happily uh, invited them into their ideological home. And soon these Marxists, because they are much more adept at politics, the Marxists are much more adept at manipulation. They're much more adept at taking control of institutions and they understand power very well. So as soon as they, well, as soon as they were able to infil infiltrate these liberal organizations, these liberal organizations slowly started becoming more leftist and Marxist. And in the end, um, that's how you, you get to today, where many of these formerly liberal organizations are just outright leftist Marxists. Um, and that's pretty much down to the fact that uh, in South Africa, and I see a lot of it in the West as well, liberals don't seem they seem to have a very strong uh, they don't seem to have a lot of disgust for marxists uh, as they sometimes claim they don't have such a strong uh, visceral disgust uh, as they sometimes claim they often are very uh, marxists are often very palatable to them if the if it's if it's necessary so that's a good answer that's, and that's she says what, uh, she says in the chat to. here she's she's sorry for such open-ended question but she's a school teacher she's used to asking <laughs> them of students <laughs> that's fine all right let's yeah. move on to the next thing we have uh mrs jess horst gave me 50 us dollars thank you so much mrs jess horst i really appreciate that uh all she sent was three white hearts and uh, she loves and appreciates what we do for white well-being. Thank you so much, Mrs. Jess Horst. Uh, you would approve of her, uh, Ernst. Uh, her and her family, uh, they are building locally, building parallel. They're not state dependent at all. And she has nine sons, nine sons. So that's uh, that's quite the achievement. Mm. Uh, next, we have Carlotta uh, for five euro. Uh, she says, keep up the great work, Yiz. Thank you very much uh, for the for the support. Uh, I don't recognize your name, Carlotta. Did you come over from, uh, is Carlotta a regular of yours, uh, Ernst? Excuse me? Uh, I said, is Carlotta uh, a regular of yours? Because uh, I don't recognize Carlotta and she paid with euros and I normally never get donations in euros. So. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to see the, 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 the profile picture or the name. It doesn't ring a bell currently. It's, uh, unfortunately, it's on, it's on entropy. And mm. there's no profile picture. It's mm. just a name. It might, be a, it might be one of my subscribers or a follower on Twitter. It could be. It could be. Yeah. Um, and let's see. Uh, we have just another moment. But let, me, let me see if there's anything juicy in the, uh, in the chat here real fast. Mm. It's hard for me to skim through. Um, no, it's fine. Like I said, it doesn't have to be a hard cut off time at eight. It's just probably around that time we're going to have to start wrapping okay. up. Okay. All right. Mm. Well, um, we've had many people here. Uh, praising what you do, uh, being happy that uh, someone cares about not just white people, but the, the preservation of a moral, just culture and our ideas that made the West good. It's nice that um, to see so many people agreeing with you or agreeing with me that you're a good guest. I, I'm happy that uh, that, my, that my my audience likes you. <laughs> yeah, your audience has been very welcoming. All right, let's see here. Uh, there's some stuff about Marxism in here. We don't need to go over again. Uh, there's some stuff agreeing Maybe, with uh, us. Just to blanket answer those questions about Marxism, I wrote an opinion piece called Not Everyone is a Liberal. If you go just Google Not Everyone is a Liberal, it's on the, the platform The Rational Standard, which is actually a classical liberal uh, uh, platform. But they wrote a piece that was criticizing uh, some of the, the claims that I made about community. 
And then they invited me to write a response uh, to that piece. So my response was called Not Everyone is a Liberal. And uh, that pretty much lays out the entire dynamic between liberal and Marxist and how it applies to South Africa. Yeah, you found it. Yep, I'm putting it in the chat right now. I'll I'll, I'll read it myself later. But uh, mm. That uh, will answer most sure of your, your chat chat's questions, I reckon, when, uh, in regards to that topic. Sure. Um, we also have a last minute uh, donation chat here, again from Shelly, the teacher. She says, for three U.S. dollars, thank you so much, Ernst, for making yourself available and willing to share your insight, ideas, and support. And she sent you a little heart. <laughs> mm. Oh, thank you very much. And, uh, and we'll go ahead and round it off there. Um, mm. I do thank you for being here today. It was wonderful. Uh, maybe we'll do a stream again in the future one day. Uh, if there's ever anything you want to do on your channel or with a group that has to do with American activism for creating the kinds of parallel things we're interested in, or you just want to have me on for an American perspective, I'm always willing to be on anybody else's uh, stream mm. or a group chat. All you have to do is just message me or hit me up on Twitter or something, and I'm glad to help. And you're, of course, always invited uh, to come talk to me if there's anything you want to do with me and my channel or or network uh, Afroform with the white well-being community and share ideas and and uh, different practices we have to to fight the state in different ways. Um, you're welcome to, to message me about anything you like. Uh, so the last thing we'll do before we say bye, is there anything that you would like to shill? Anything uh, <laughs> coming up in your near future, a particular event, or just want to ask people to... Uh, the, to share the Afroform link, perhaps anything you'd mm. like to, to shill or, or share before we leave? Yeah, so for the very briefly, uh, if, you, if you're curious about South Africa and the type of ideas that I discussed tonight, you can uh, go check out my YouTube channel, Conscious Caracal. Um, uh, these are the type of things that I discussed tonight. These are the things that I discuss uh, on my channel. Um, and you can also follow me on Twitter, same uh, same username, Conscious Caracal. And then lastly, if you want to support what AfriForum does as a foreigner or not a non-South African, uh, you can't become a member. You can only become a member if you're South African, but you can still support the organization be by becoming a friend of AfriForum. So you just Google friends of AfriForum, and they, it's, it's very easy to become a friend, and then you become a, 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 a supporter of AfriForum there, uh, and you'll be able to... If you do choose to become a financial supporter, you will uh, help AfriForum build state-proof communities here at the southern tip of Africa. All right. Well, again, thank you for being here. Um, I look forward to uh, all the great streams on your channel. And uh, you usually mm. do them on Tuesday each week, yes? Yes, Tuesday at uh, 7 o'clock Central Africa time. Uh, the same time that we just spoke today. Um, I'm almost mm. always there in the chat for the last mm, couple of months. I really I've been, appreciate I, I've it. been listening if I haven't been there in the chat, but uh, it's been wonderful. Yeah. I love the people you have on. And I highly recommend all of you guys that are listening today um, for an hour one Tuesday in the near future, come listen to a stream on Ernst's channel. You'll learn a lot. Mm -hmm. You'll have a good time. You'll meet some moral, high-minded people that care about culture and race and all the stuff that we care about. It's a really good community that that is built around him, just like we're trying to build here. So let's uh, let's share community together. With that being said, uh, God bless uh, uh, you, Ernst. God bless Afroform, and uh, may our people have a great future. Thank you. Goodbye, very much. everybody. God bless. Walk well.